It was Christmas night eve in Kildare Street. The Taoiseach was still at his desk. He'd had trouble from Garrett Fitzgerald, and Frank Klosky was slightly berserk. <laughs> Only now could he open his presses. Not a sign of tobacco or booze, but a 12-month supply of observers from his dear old pal, Connor the Prune. <laughs> From Deputy Cosgrave, a letter. Dear Charlie, you're in for some shocks. Here's the book that will make you my debtor. Hints on haunting the mongrel fox. <laughs> watch, watch out for the slag and big Roger and the rest of that treacherous pack. Make sure when their hands goes behind you, it's a slap, not a stab in the back. <laughs> Well, happy Christmas to you all, especially those of you who aren't watching the programme. Isn't it well for you that there's something better to occupy your time? Well, look at this. Isn't it desperate? A man in my position, moonlighting in order to keep the wolf from the door. And then they talk about the big money and the glamour and RTE. Look at him. It's bad as the Mike Murphy show. Oh, I shouldn't do this, you know, it's my ruination. <laughs> just a little one then, just a little one. Oh, well, well, girls, our last coffee morning before Christmas. <laughs> and what an eventful year it has been, Rosa dear. Well, yes indeed, Fanny dear. Do you remember the year of what we call it, last January? Mm. Oh, yes, Croy. And then the February, or March, I think it was. Or maybe it was later, there was that. Sort of... you, you know what I'm talking about. As if it was yesterday, Mavis, the, um... Oh, yes, I remember. And, and, and will you ever forget um, what happened in, um, in, in May? No. April, Rosa. It was when the minister for what had said, uh, he said... Um, oh, that's it, Fanny. Sure, you have a wonderful memory for dates. <laughs> that's and why you have such a large family. <laughs> <laughs> then there was something in June. Oh. Oh, it's a nice dry sherry. But what's this? That's what's that? Oh, Didn't you there's something about Sir Jack Finch. Yes, he took over from... Somebody or other. Yes, well, uh, well, girls, let's drink a toast to the old year. Oh, what a memorable year it has been. Good idea, Rosa. Here's a toast to good old 76. Good old, good old 76. 76. And all who sail in her. <laughs> but that was last year, Mavis. It's only ten days away now to 1978. Really? This is the first I heard of it. What happened to 1977? That's what a lot of people are asking themselves in varying degrees of sobriety. What happened in 1977? Now, for some strange reason, television programmes have a habit of dragging up the events of the past year at a time when many viewers don't even know which year it is. And why should we be an exception? So, whether you like it or not, here are a few highlights from Hall's Victorian Weekly, starting with the appointment last January of the new Minister for War. Now, the Minister for Hardship, remember him? He had just revealed that his choice lay between the Minister for Gateposts and Telegraph Poles and Oliver J. Cromwell, the boy from Ballymagash. I have decided that it's between yourself and Oliver J. here. It's a great honour, mine Fuhrer, to be one of the two best men for the job. Uh, who said anything about the best men for the job? Who else is there? I mean, I had to put our cock friend in charge of reading and writing now that Dick the Scholar has gone off to persecute the people in, in Brussels. There'd be murder down there if I, if I didn't have passed him over. Well, no, I couldn't give it to what's-his-name that's already he's uh, speaking Irish, or, or that other fella who had that, uh, that, that farming program on the TV. Wish he'd never left it. I mean, the jealousy there would have been something fierce. Jimmy Curry, of course, is out too, since he's the only man who knows how the constituencies is carved up, and of course, there, with an election coming up this year, he can't be spared. But there is Richie Roon, of course, and Garrett Fitzgurgle, but uh, I couldn't see the, either of them attending the artillery exercises in the Glen of a Mob. They're too highly strung to put up with the gunfire. And what about Tom Fitz, my Fiora? Oh, God, yes, I clean forgot about poor Tom. What's this he's in charge of at the moment? Well, never mind now, it's too late to be, to be thinking about Tom Fitz. For better or for worse, it's between the two of you, the best of a bad lot, God help us all. Every time you open your mouth, Crohor, I think of what the Duke of Wellington said to the conscripts before the Battle of Corona. I don't know if they will frighten the enemy, says he, but they certainly frighten me. <laughs> a good. wonderful compliment, my Fiora. On the other hand, of course, Oliver occupies a strategic position in our defence plans. Your line of communications between Ballymagash and Cleary's Oliver is vital to our defensive position against the Fianna Fáil attack. 
with all those panhandle cars and whipper tanks at your disposal, of course, well, there wouldn't be a woman in your entire area that, you couldn't, de that couldn't depend on you to bring home the messages uh, for, 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 from the town. You'd mop up every vote in the constituency. On top of that, of course, you are one of our own, unlike Rahur here. You never know where you stand with those intellectuals. Mm. You're not being quite fair, my Fiona. Oh, never let it be said that I ever showed any favouritism to any man. My choice will be decided by the fickle finger of fate. You, you mean you want us to roll the dice for it, man, Fiora? The way you picked Dick the Scholar for the Brussels uh, job? Oh, no. This must be above suspicion. Here we go. Eeny, meeny, miny, moe, catch a baby by the toe. If he hollers, let him go. Eeny, meeny, miny, moe, out you go. Oh, there's something wrong there. I'll do that again. <clears throat> eeny, meeny, miny, moe, catch a baby by the toe. If he squeeze, let him go. Eeny, meeny, miny, moe, out you go. Ah, oh, sorry about that, Crahor. <laughs> Off you go now, Oliver, me boy, and get yourself measured up for a suitable dress uniform. I'll give you the address of General Amin's military tailor. I've nothing against theories, mind you, of course, but this does call for something that is a wee bit special. <laughs> <laughs> The wisdom of the minister's choice became apparent a few months later when the rumours of war hardened into a certainty. Yes, people were speaking openly about the possibility of a general election, and how much closer to war can you get than that? Many experts forecast a walkover for the close relations government. It will be a walkover for the close relations crowd. A walkover. Well, that's what the experts do be seeing on the TV anyway, yeah? And so the other ones that controls public opinion, you know, the experts. But my, uh, only for them experts, boy, the likes of us would know what to think, would we? Oh, speak for yourself, yeah. I always knows what I think, especially when I'm after finishing reading the newspapers. But tell me this now. Do poor Jack have a hope at all, do you think? Well, with all these educated men again, him, yeah, we don't give him much hope. Uh, me and experts, that is. Ah, uh, the poor man. Of course, I'll say this. Uh, Jack have one card up his sleeve. He know one thing that the others don't know, despite all their education. And what's that, boy, eh? He knows how to talk soft to the nuns. Uh, you know? Oh, boy, Jack and no fool. Uh Precisely. The Minister for Hardship, realising his disadvantage, lost no time in consulting his new Minister for War, Oliver J. Cromwell. Oliver J. is no dozer himself when it comes to chatting up the nuns. Boy, I did you a good turn when I made you Minister for War. Oh. Now I want you to do something for me. Anything, mein Führer. Who do you want shot? I know, it's, I know it's nothing like that, Oliver, mm. but uh, with the elections coming up, I'm looking for a few tips on how to soft-soap the nuns. There's about 40 convents in my constituency, and I never know what to say, only, hello, nice to see you, uh, to see you, nice. It makes me feel like that Aegis on the British TV, Bruce Forsyth. <laughs> the nuns aren't like normal women, you know, you can't ask them how's the husband and family getting on. So what else can you say to a woman when you're looking for our vote? Yes, well, do you see, I always begin by asking the nuns, have they been to Rome lately and how's the Holy Father looking? That'll keep them going as for as long as you like. They're absolutely daft about the Holy Father, you know. They talk about him all day if you let them. Yeah, but supposing they weren't in Rome, I'd be nicely Shanghai then, wouldn't I? Oh, never fear, mine Führer. If the nuns haven't just been to Rome, they're always just about to go. They're absolutely mad about Rome, whatever they see in the place. Sure, our lingus will go bust without them. Now, no, no, tell me, Oliver, is there any danger that they might ask me some contrary old question? For instance, where do I stand on contraception or divorce or the like of that guff? No danger in the world at all. The nuns is dead cute, you know. The minute they laid eyes on you, Chief, they'd know where you stood on issues like that. Along with me, you're crossing the opposition lobby with the feeling fallers. <laughs> Bad and all as they are, and, and, and otherwise. Oh, no, no, the nuns would have you sorted out from the word go, mine Führer. You know, any man that wears now uh, lace-up boots, a hard collar, brass stud, short back and sides, has no time whatsoever for contraception or divorce. <laughs> I believe our friend Jack Finch goes down big in the nuns' parlours. Well, unfortunately, there's no doubt about it. He's the Val Dunigan of the convent circuit. I was talking to his manager recently, and he tells me that he's booked up solid from now until election time. Three appearances a day, as well as confirmations and First Holy Communions. Oh, the Chancellor. What has he got now that I haven't got? Well, of course, you see, his appearance is a great asset. 
look. It's that innocent altar boy look. He'd have made a fortune travelling for altar wine or rosary beads. And of course, the sore leg is a great godsend, you know. He only has to stumble in and have him buried and rub his relics and remedies and miraculous medals and leaflets. And of course, he always finishes up with a few verses at the banks. They love that, you know. That goes down a bomb. You see, a lot of the nuns are from Cork. Most of them, in fact, for some reason or other. That's apart from the ones that come from Castletown, Gagan, Milltown Pass, Mullingar, Old Castle and Kilmessen. Be God, I, I, I'm down the course, so should I haven't got a note. All I could do is show them me bunions uh, and do my impersonation of me hollow hair. Oh, no, you, what? no, 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 don't, don't, don't lose heart, mind for her. What you'll do is tell them that you have an unshakable belief in the power of prayer. Make up some yarn about some miraculous escape from almost certain disaster brought about by making the nine first Fridays. Miraculous escape? What would that be now, I wonder? Well, the last election is a good example. That was a miraculous escape for you as far as I'm concerned. You had somebody's prayers, and that's a certainty. Oh, that, that sounds good. I'll make a note of that. And nice to be able to tell the honest truth for a change. <laughs> but now, what about the rest of the lads? Should I take them with me, do you think? Oh, God forbid that the good nuns had ever lay eyes on them. Oh, the Holy Sisters know where they stand <laughs> on issues like a divorce. Etc. <laughs> How do we put up with that shower at all? Yeah, but what will we do with them? Well, Fiskargal can do the pubs. Richie can do the bookie shops. Bird's Eye can do the fish and chip shops. And the rest of the lads can hang around the street corners and molest the general public. And the labour crowd can go to hell as far as I'm concerned. But you and I will handle the nuns. I like it, I like it, I like it. <laughs> you and me together, Oliver. Hope be God we'll be like Sundance and the Butch Kid. Partners. Partners? A wise precaution. Their mistake was they left it too late. Making friends with the good sisters, you know, is the greatest political gift of all and the hardest to acquire. I mean, it takes more than a shake of the hands to fool those good ladies because, when you think about it, they knew most of these political figures before they were able to spell agenda. Many of them still can't, but that's no fault of the nuns. They can't make bricks without straw. Anyway, while our two friends were laying their um, plans to capture the nuns' votes, the old master, Jack Finch himself, was out on the convent trail chalking up those vital votes. How's welcome, Mr. Finch. There's no one we'd rather see than yourself. Except the Holy Father himself, of course. A wonderful man. I had the pleasure of meeting and speaking with him a couple of years ago, of course. Um, How interesting. Is it any harm to ask you what he had to say, Mr. Finch? Well, he expressed a keen interest in the spiritual and temporal welfare of the Irish people, particularly the people of Ballymagash. Uh, that was when I was leader of the Irish people, of course. Well, as far as we sisters are concerned, you still are, Mr. Finch. We'd <laughs> die for you, wouldn't we, Sister Dominica? Indeed we would. But please, God, it won't be long till you're our leader once again. I know I can rely on you nuns. <clears throat> What else did the Holy Father have to say, Mr. Finch? Well, I took the opportunity of telling him about your wonderful sale of work for the Ballymagash Abbey Restoration Fund, and he said you were great women altogether. Oh, there's a crown in store for you in heaven, Mr. Finch. And 37 first preference votes in this convent. Even the Reverend Mother will have to give you her number one when she hears this news. Mm. Between ourselves, Mr. Finch, she was canvassing hard for Oliver J. Cromwell, but he'll have to light a terrible lot of candles to offset this. I must say that Oliver J. is a great favourite with all the nuns. He's so helpful and kind. What's the matter, Mr. Finch? Well, the old leg is at me again, sister. Oh, no, oh, nothing serious, I hope. Ah, uh, no, I just broke it in four places dear, when I slipped dear. and fell on the steps of Cologne Cathedral coming out of high mass with the cardinal and the papal nuncio. All I can say is thanks be to God it was me and not one of them. Oh, you poor dear man, it must have been agonising. Well, it's fierce altogether, but sure, every time I get a dart, but I just offer it up for the Pope's intentions. If only the rest of the people had your Christian piety and fortitude, Mr. Finch. Sure, I'd put up with two broken legs if it was for the good of the Irish people, whom I hope to have the uh, honour of leading after the next election. That is with the help of God, of course. Of with course, of blessed be the will of God. If I get back in, you see, Jimmy Collier's carved up the constituency is something awful. I mean, half this convent is in another area, but sure, if I don't get back in, I'm resigned to the will of God. But that is not the will of God, Mr. Finch, and we will storm heaven with our prayers to keep him in mind. Well, uh, your votes will come in very handy as well. Well, now, sisters, um, <clears throat> I'll be going now. I don't want to take up any more of your not precious at all. time. No, 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 I know how busy you are doing God's work. Go, 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 and ask him. He won't refuse you, Sister Dominica. Oh, very well, then. Sure, he can't eat me. He can't. <clears throat> Mr. Finch, 
before you go were dying to hear you sing a few bars of the banks. That, of course, is if it's not too much trouble with no, your no, sore leg. No, no, give me the greatest of oh, pleasure. Come on, Actually, come on, it's a great favour to the Holy Father himself. Oh, it's such a pity <laughs> Reverend Mother won't be here to hear this. Do you know that Oliver J, with all his sanctity, never had the privilege of singing for the Pope? that voice, I feel all funny. I don't know what comes over me. I wonder, is this the way our senior girls feel when they listen to the Bay City Rollers? And the rest, as they say, is history. And I lost the finest cabinet that any man ever had. No hard feelings, though, so long as it's for the good of the country. Speaking of which, I wonder what thoughts are going through the mind of the man himself as he looks back on this momentous year. Well, darling, would you have believed sitting here 12 months ago that you'd be where you are today? Well, in all honesty, a story I'd have to answer yes to that question. Well, aren't you the secretive one? You never told me that before. Oh, there are a lot of things I don't tell anyone, even you, Akushla. Oh, you rascal. Oh, well, that's where the other crowd went wrong, you see. They couldn't stop talking, even when they had nothing to say. That's why they talk so much. But in all fairness, dear, they said it so beautifully, and that's something I'd be meaning to talk to you about. Our lads. Our lads? What about them? Have they been up to something behind my back? Oh, quite the opposite, dear. No, we never seem to hear from them at all, except John Winsome, and he only speaks in Latin. Well, it's a poor family that can't rear one scholar. And sure, as long as he sticks to the Latin, he'll come to no harm. Sure, nobody can understand a word he says, not even myself. Yes, but the rest of our boys seem to be so shy. I mean, compared to Dimples and Crahour and Dick the Scholar, they seem positively backward. I mean, shouldn't they be having lessons on how to perform on television? We should have two men working full-time, trying to keep them off the television. Should the other crowd were never off the box, and look at what happened to them. Yes, but what will the people think of them if they don't appear on television from time to time? Well, they won't think about them at all. With the help of God, they won't even know they're there. Sure, our lads are far too busy minding their good jobs without rushing out to Telefisheren to oblige them every time they're stuck for an item on some political show. I'm running a government, you know, not a chat show. But, but... But, but, but that means that you'll have to do all the talking on television. I sure want to be the harm in that. Aren't the people daft about me? <laughs> I know, dear. You've told me that often enough. But what will you say? Well, as little as possible. I don't want everybody knowing my business. You're perfectly right. Those television people are so ill-mannered, always asking rude questions. Well, it's not the rude questions I mind, so long as they don't start asking me the awkward questions. That's why I want to keep the other lads off the television. They're not cute enough. And God grant they stay that way. You're cute enough for the whole lot of them. Mm. Damn it, we'll have Drisheen instead. By the way, I'm sure you know where we are. We're in the bar in Linster House. And I'm trying to kill two birds with one stone by trying to find out if the new administration will fall into the same trap, working too hard and not playing enough. So, without further delay, we're going over to join Farrell O'Brien, who is waiting, indeed dying, to talk to you in another room. Over now to Farrell O'Brien. Good evening and a very happy Christmas to you. This is your favourite pundit, Farrell O'Brien, Ireland's answer to Robin Day, speaking to you from Leinster House, where everyone is in a festive mood, uh, including me. Which makes a delightful change, doesn't it? Well, I don't really approve of this foolishness, of course. Indeed, I'm only taking this seasonable opportunity to prove that I'm only human after all. Well, nearly human, in spite of vicious rumours to the contrary, which have been circulated by my inferiors. No matter what you may think, I do really don't want to give the impression that I'm better than you are, even though I am. Well, well, and who is this approaching? If it isn't the member for Horse and Jockey North Central, Deputy Crawford Beamish himself. 
Deputy, I would like your comment on a statement which was made on television recently. Oh, certainly, young man. <laughs> it was my tie straight. Well, it's straighter than you are, Deputy. No, the statement is here, and I quote, Beer, like most things in life, has to be treated with care. Now, what do you say to that? Oh, I agree. Absolutely. 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 Yeah, why, Deputy? Well, because, because Cheryl has never done saying that. <laughs> Thank God he moved. I thought he was dead for a minute. Now, in sharp contrast to the, this religious attitude of the, the beer manufacturers is the attitude of another branch of the Irish drink industry. Now, this consists of a body of courageous, daring entrepreneurs with enough faith in their customers to let them do whatever they like with the product. They don't care. They don't want to annoy them with these confusing commercials about going easy on it and all that kind of thing. Now, these people believe that if a man wants a drink, then that's it, he wants a drink and no more about it. What they say is the use of telling them that it's dangerous. Well, they point out, the government warnings on the cigarette packets hasn't stopped people from smoking. <laughs> Right, right, squeeze on, lad. Am I on yet? Oh, how are you? This is it, how are you? Well, now this here now is a TV commercial for Puchin, not beer. The Irish Puchin Makers Association represents all Irish Puchin Makers, except a few of us in jail at the present time. Bad luck to the bloody guards, anyway. And as for the DJs, the centre lads up, may the devil strike a raw hot hum Sunday. <laughs> I wouldn't mind only half of them. Takes the stuff home with them in the boot of the car when the court is over. <laughs> <laughs> the drink always had a bad name. You're right, you're right, you're right. We had the pioneers to thank for that. <laughs> so nobody look at it if it had a good name. You think Pachin misuse it as much as you can. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise <laughs> you won't enjoy it. <laughs> so in the name of God, how can anyone enjoy it if they weren't drunk? <laughs> <laughs> it's the same with beer and entertainment. And so remember, Irish Putin has a bad name. For God's sake, don't try to give it a good one. <laughs> Unless you're out to destroy us entirely. How about that, lad? Oh, <laughs> good man, Pat. Hey, hey, I, I, I wonder what them three mock valentines on that beer ad will say when they see this. <laughs> So far, I regret to say, tonight's programme has all been about drink and other forms of associated foolishness. Same as the rest of all the other Bloomin' programmes at this time of the year. It's awful. But just to be different, I thought to myself that I would end the programme on what you might call a sober note. You understand what I'm talking about? A sober note. And God knows it'll be the only sober note that'll be struck on any television programme between now and the New Year's Day. Now, we are now going to spend just a few quiet minutes with some of the gallant men who are helping to keep the wheels of civilization turning in this unfortunate country of ours. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Happy Christmas, Beto. Oh, and a happy Christmas to you, Rumpo. And God bless our new minister. I hear he's a decent man. Oh, I heard that myself, Speedo, and a hand graft of the yeah. same as all the Longford people, self-made man, got where he is today by his own efforts. No thanks to nobody. Well, that makes four of us. <laughs> you, me, Fiddleface, and the new minister. That's right. The four horsed men of the apolitics, that's us. Mind you, mind you, I have no time for capitalism. No. But the three of us take the pride in our war. Yeah. Now, we wouldn't let ourselves down be swinging the lad. Oh, no. Matters. That's what we are. Matters. Matters to the sacred cause of duty. Always on the job. Yeah. Except for the odd international match or yeah. wedding or a yeah. Monday morning sick head. But we're never idle from morning till night. We never Always are. given of our best irregardless of the circumstances. Yeah. Well, all around us, we see a shower a shifty shaggers sloping oh, yes. secretly home from the dull office to the bills and voice of virtue. But things are not as desperate as our two friends thought. Not by any means. Because shortly after that conversation took place, a big advertisement appeared in all the newspapers. Here's the important part of it for you. Become a manufacturing entrepreneur. 
Well, now, to make a long story short, you put up, say, £15,000. The IDA puts up £15,000. Somebody else, I uh, can't remember who it is, they put up £15,000. Then the bank comes along and puts up the rest, and before you know where you are, you have a grand new business worth at least £400,000. And then it's up to you to run it into the ground. So, you see, you don't actually have to work at all. You can become an entrepreneur instead, and that beats work any day. Now, what kind of people will qualify for these grants? The mothers of seven were deeply interested in that question. Well, I don't really think it worked out as well as everybody else thought it worked. I might Well, girls, what did you think of that big advertisement for, what did they call them, Fanny? Advertising, uh, I mean manufacturing entrepreneurs. Oh, good girl, Fanny, weren't you great to be able to pronounce a word like that? Yes, I wonder what it means. Oh, well, of course, I, I often hear my husband using it to his business associates, but I don't like to ask him when he's busy. I would have thought, Gronia, that you would have learned it at boarding school. <laughs> they didn't teach commercial subjects at my oh. boarding school, Rosa dear. Only cultural subjects. How to get a man, she means. <laughs> but I'm sure you can tell us what it means, Rosa dear. There is so little you don't appear to know. Of course I know what it means, Mavis. By the way, shouldn't you go a little bit easy on the sherry? Your nose has got very red. Oh, that's just a head cold, actually. My oh. eyes are streaming. <laughs> no, you were going to explain to us about these entrepreneurs. Oh, that's a dreadful oh. cold you have, Mavis, dear. It's even affecting your vocal cords. <laughs> well. Yes, I can feel it getting into my throat. Now, don't worry about me, Rosa. Just carry on. I'm all ears. Well, actually, it's very technical, girls. I don't think it's really the sort of thing we should be discussing on a social occasion like this. It's a more suitable subject for the junior chamber to be talking about. <laughs> don't be ridiculous, Rosa. Sure, all they ever talk about the junior chamber is women. Everybody knows that. Oh, I must take you so with you over there, Mavis, dear. My husband is a member of the junior chamber. Is he really? Yes, he is. And after all, and I hate to have to mention this, but we are much younger than any of you. He's still young enough to qualify for membership. That's quite enough, Gronya. I admit that the other girls and I are, well, quite mature. But there's no reason to be malicious about it. Well, I like that. Malicious. It wasn't very nice of Mavis to say that all they talk about at the junior chamber is women. My husband would never do a thing like that. Oh. Not if you were listening, Gronya, dear. <laughs> Did you hear that? She's at it again. Don't pay any attention. She's a little bit... <laughs> I saw that, Fanny. You're a nice one to talk. You could drink locker and dry and fill it again immediately. I most certainly am not duck. I simply took too much medi night. It doesn't agree with the show. Oh, <laughs> now I've heard everything. I think you've done enough harm already, Gronia, without heaping fuel on the flames. Don't you speak to me like that, Rosa. I mean, after all, none of this would have happened oh. if you had been able to answer Mavis' question in the first place. How dare you say that to me, you ignorant little non-entity? Neither you nor your stupid husband would know what it meant if every professor in Cork University took us in turns to explain it to you. Oh, oh don't be like that, for heaven's sake, Rosa dear. Can't you tell her what it means? I wouldn't lower myself. I wouldn't give her the satisfaction. Not after what she just said to me. Why don't you tell her what it means if you're so concerned? And don't think that I couldn't just because I don't oh. earn my knowledge just like some people I could mention. I'm quite happy to tell Grandia what it means. It means... What was that uh, word you uh, mentioned, Mavis, dear? What word? I never mentioned any word. I haven't opened my mouth the whole morning. You girls were too busy talking about some French word. Would it be too much to ask you, Mavis, what, or which word uh, you're alluding to? Well, the word we were talking about. I can't quite remember it just at the moment, Rosa dear. But I think it was the word they use in the leading poor of shops to describe French knickers. <laughs> it's most unusual for the mothers of seven to find themselves at a loss like that. But then again, they weren't the only ones, you know, because, after all, it's, it's most unusual for advertisements in this country to carry unusual words like, um, um, what's, what was it again? Manufacturing entrepreneurs. Oh, yes. What I meant to say was that some of the craftiest men in the country were taken aback when they saw that word. Now, there's no junior chamber in Ballymagash. Just the large, old-fashioned family size. But the businessmen of the town aren't stuck for a place to meet and discuss their, their problems. Where else but the common chero, bar, grill, art gallery and discotheque? Who's business, Tommy? Jerry and Bolly kill Joe. The girls is out there clamping down and the smuggling the pigs. Who about yourself? Ah, the same story with me. They've caught down to the butter smuggling racket. Do you know what it is, Tommy? We were better off under the British. You couldn't trust your own crowd to play the game. Hey, listen to this, lads. Listen to this. 
If you have the right ideas and business experience, <laughs> the IDR offers you the opportunity of a lifetime. Become a manufacturing enter entrepen and ah, some foreign word. Is it? What is it? This foreign word. I, I, never mind about that. Never mind. But you, you just listen to the rest of it. Under the IDR's new development programme, there are unlimited opportunities. Do you hear that, lads? Uh -huh. Unlimited opportunities to become a first-time entrepreneur. Oh. What I said, what I said. If you are an executive manager or a specialist with the enterprise and know-how... Oh, that's us! Oh, that's us! Oh, that's that's us. us. your own factory, the IDR will provide generous financial assistance and the advice you need to realise your ambition. Ah, what do you think of that? There's a catch in it somewhere. Oh. Why are they putting in all them foreign words into it for? They've never done that before. Oh, sure, it's, it's the EEC is the cause of that. Didn't you hear Richard Burke on the radio talking about his, his cabinet? That's French for cabinet. Your board falls, you have to make me put in B debts. That's English for BDs. They're no, catching no. it somewhere, Tommy. Or else now they wouldn't be using that foreign word. Why is it, Mr. Mike? Uh, uh, enter, enter, enter something. Aye, there's a catch in it, I'm telling you. You know what it is? They're ashamed to say what sort of yokes it is that wants the people to manufacture. That's what it is. Yokes. What's that about yokes? Huh? Wasn't there some talk in the papers a few years ago about yokes? Oh, Mr. Mac, do you know I think you're right, eh? Do you know, there's something to do with, 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 with women's lib. Jen huh? Healy reported it there beyond in, 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 in the Irish Times. Oh, it was a model anyway. Even the late late show wouldn't mention it. Am I right, Jan? Am God, I right? you have it, Tommy. That's what oh, you're getting. That's what you're getting, huh? They wants us to flood the market with them yokes, them in, in turf, whatever you call them. God, you say so, huh? Oh, well, we couldn't have that, would we? No. I mean, it'd be against our conscience, oh, what about wouldn't it? it? What, what, what do you think? What, what, I mean, what, what. smuggling, tax dodging, sheep rustling, buying stuff that falls off the back of a lorry. I don't mind that. That's just illegal, like, you know. I don't mind them things. But I'll have no hand, act or part in manufacturing them, enter, whatever you call them. Them's a model. I don't mind doing jail, but I, I, I don't want to be uh, struck dead all of a sudden. Are you with me, go, Tommy? Oh, we go. I'm with you. I'm I'm with you. Me too. I, I don't want to meet a sudden end either. Uh, I, I mean, it's bad enough putting in planning <coughs> applications like in Irish to, to, to cod the, the, the local residents, you know, but advertising for to make them immoral yokes in French. <laughs> oh, we got, I knew there was a catch in it somewhere. I know that. Pity the way, darling. January is a quiet month in the tourist trade. So the members of the National Tourism Association of Ireland take advantage of this seasonal lull to hold their annual retreat, or seminar as they prefer to call it. This year it took place in Wexford and penitents, members I should say, came from everywhere to attend. The opening session was addressed by the Reverend, I mean the Chairman, Mr Francis Xavier McGurk, a leading hotelier and a saintly figure in his own right. <coughs> My dear brother persons and sister persons, the press persons may wonder why we persons refer to our annual retreat as a seminar. The reason is simple. It's because we are too humble to pay attention to the deeply spiritual nature of our calling. Amen. Amen. But we in the industry are constantly striving to bring God back into the lives of our customers. Far too many of them look upon a stay in the many fine hotels in this country as an escape from the tedium of their daily lives. A fortnight of luxurious living filled with occasions of sin. Mayor Kulfa. It is our constant aim to send them home again with a new awareness of God's infinite mercy. Our motto is, an Irish holiday is not so much a pleasure, more of an experience. And during the next few days, we will look back over the past year to see what we did wrong and decide if we can get away with it again next year. And we shall ask God to give us strength to channel our ways and our menus, uh, and perhaps give the public better service and better value for money at some time in the future. So far, Hallelujah. our prayers have not been answered, but that won't stop us from trying again. Like our clients, 
We still believe in miracles. Here, here. God bless you all. Here, here. The other besetting sin of the Irish tourist trade appears to be a slight tendency towards falsehood. Well, in a leading article headed National Boasting, the Irish Times put it like this. There are lies, damned lies and tourist advertisements. A Swiss tour operator accused the industry here of selling to the unsuspecting foreigner a vision of Ireland and of the Irish people which no longer existed. <laughs> Mark Blowney, Fitzweedle. Yes. Did you read this editorial in the Irish Times? Some Swiss operator is looking for honest and straightforward publicity from us. Why us, for God's sake? Yeah, you're begging your honour's pardon. <laughs> no. Maybe it's because uh, we're selling the unsuspecting foreigner a vision of Ireland and the Irish people which no longer existed. Uh, first paragraph. What do you mean, Mac Blowney? You're not reading the lesson in Mount Merion now, you know. Uh, uh, no offence, your graciousness. All I mean is that we have codded convinced the unsuspecting <laughs> foreigner uh, that they'll be after tripping over saints and scholars when they come to Ireland. Uh, maybe this Swiss gentleman thinks our adverts uh, should be like that too. <laughs> Damn it, McBlarney, we're in the tourist racket, not a monastery. It's our business to sell, sell, sell. You get nowhere in this rash race reciting the Ten Commandments. Uh, sorry, pardon me for speaking like this, son. Oh, that's OK, Fitzweedle. All my underlings are entitled to address me man to man once. <laughs> this you. is your opportunity. Don't waste it. Uh, thank you, sir. Oh, no, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm a true Christian, sir. Well, what are you doing in this outfit? <laughs> uh, don't mind him, Your Honour, sir. He's only a bit highly strong. Uh, yes, uh, it's about our dishonest and crooked publicity, sir. Uh, thank you, Fitzweedle, but uh, take my advice. And leave the flattery to McBlarney. He's a past master at it. Oh, God <laughs> bless your honour, sir. A little word like that. Sure, it's better be far than a substantial increase in me wages, son. <laughs> oh, you're a wonderful man entirely. God bless you. Uh, have you taught, uh, sir? Yeah, yeah, call him your honour oh, yeah. if you want to survive. He likes that. Right. Right. Uh, has your honour taught at the consequences of this policy of deceiving the unsuspecting foreigners with the vision of a non existent Ireland? <laughs> According to statistics, it came to four hundred million pounds last year. Although we know that inflation helped to boost those figures, not bad, Fitzweedle, not bad. Uh, what your honour, oh, sir? Oh, that's just tough uh, to give me. Yes, that's yes, yes. What your honour, sir? Uh, is it worth it? Uh, what is four hundred million allowing for inflation against the fair name of our beloved country <laughs> and the safety of our immortal souls? Oh, no lie can be lawful or innocent. Uh, easy on there. Uh, You're uh, treading on dangerous ground. I respect your qualms of conscience, Fitzweedle. Yes, sir. <laughs> Mostly because of your brother-in-law, the minister. Grand Vanter. But these aren't real lies. They're only... They're only... They're only what, McBlarney? Yeah, for poetical exaggerations, your <laughs> magnificence. <laughs> you have a great gift, McBlarney, for taking the words out of my mouth. That's all they are, Fitzweedle. Poetic exaggerations. That's all. Not real lies. Uh, a, a truth that's told with bad intent beats all the lies you can invent. Oh. <laughs> uh, William Blake, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Quite so, Fitzweedle. Yes. Remind me to give that Blake a rise. Tusky, take a note of that. But remember this. We're not telling lies for ourselves, you know. We're telling them for... for who are we telling them for, McBlarney? Uh, for Ireland, uh, Your Honour, uh, sir. <laughs> We're telling them for Ireland. <laughs> Well, what do you say to that, Fitzweedle? Oh, sir, hey, your honour, sir, no man can lie enough for Ireland. Yeah, you know, especially in the tourist racket. Right. God bless it, sir. God bless it. Yeah. Amen to that, I say, amen. Well, if you're not pleased with the look of this new five-pound note, don't say that I didn't do my best to warn you, because it's not today nor yesterday that I first drew attention to the woebegone appearance of the lovely Kathleen. No, no. Over the past few years, I couldn't help noticing her sad expression, her pinched cheeks and the defeated slope of her shoulders, she who was once so proud and happy. So I wasn't particularly surprised. Hurt, yes, but not surprised when they handed her her walking papers. And the lousy way they did it, that's the most disgraceful part of the entire discreditable episode. Not a word of regret, not a single expression of appreciation, not as much as a shake of the hand, much less a golden handshake. Just a curt announcement from the Central Bank. The Central Bank of Ireland announces that a new design £5 note will be issued on and from Monday, the 1st of November, 1976. I wonder what the lovely Kathleen herself thinks of this shabby treatment. 
Well, I can't say I'm sorry, really, especially these last few years. To tell you the truth, I think they were trying to humiliate me. And well, why would they do a thing like that? To get me to resign, of course. I mean, the last thing they wanted to do was to get rid of me openly, you know, women's lib and all that. But I said, no, they can say what they like and they can do what they like, but here I stay until they put me out. <laughs> you get no thanks for resigning, you know. People forget very quickly. But just ask him, um, what was his name? Could you give me a few specific examples of the ways in which they humiliated you? Well, they made me feel so cheap. I mean, I remember the time when you had to be somebody before you made my acquaintance. It wasn't every Tom, Dick and Harry that could make free with me those days. Oh, no, they were the days when I thought that every street was like Grafton Street. Well, you must have led a very sheltered life. Oh, don't be talking. I used to be kept under lock and key for fear I might get lost or fall into the wrong hands. Sometimes I wouldn't be out of the house for weeks on end. And the fuss they made of me when I was taken out, I always travelled in the best Morocco leather cases, you know. Ah, well, they don't make them like that anymore. And everyone would handle me so gently, pick me up by my extremities for fear of causing unsightly wrinkles, lay me down on my back to avoid ruffling my exterior. But well, they knew how to take care of a lady in those days. What was your most embarrassing moment? <laughs> Just last week in the gents' toilet in Leinster House, of all places. Although that's a place now that's seen better days, too. What happened in Leinster House? Well, I'm almost ashamed to tell you. The attendant had forgotten to replenish the supply of <coughs> tissues. All of a sudden, a bell rang, the division bell, I believe they call it. The man I was with had been carving something on the back of the door with his penknife, and he jumped up in a terrible splutter. Well, when he discovered his predicament, uh, over the tissue, I mean, I thought my last hour had come. What happened? What happened? Oh, I must have had somebody's prayers that day. Just before, just when I thought I was about to make the supreme sacrifice, something made him shout out, has anybody out there got five singles? Imagine what would have become of me if the toilet had been empty. Oh, I've had my ups and downs, young man, but I nearly touched bottom that day. Here is the news. Reactions were mixed when the new Irish £5 note made its appearance this morning. There was panic on the London stock market, where brokers were under the impression that Red China was trying to flood the market with funny money. A spokesman for the Chinese embassy, Mr. Won Long Dong, later denied this. Mr. Long Dong said, a joke is a joke, but this is going too far. After a brief rally, Wall Street took to its heels and has not been seen since. On the Irish stock market, gilts were up, knickers were down, and brokers made the most of their opportunities. Speaking from his hometown in Plains, Georgia, where he has been roasting his nuts, the US president-elect, Mr Jimmy Carter, told newsmen, It's true that in my heart I've lusted after women, but having seen this joker on the new Irish five-pound note, I have decided to turn over a new leaf, if that's what reading Playboy magazine does to you. It's hard to believe the poor guy was only 32 when that picture was taken. In the House of Commons, the introduction of the new fiver precipitated a sharp clash between the British Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition, who thinks she is the Prime Minister. So does the Prime Minister. Mrs Thatcher said, This is what comes of signing the treaty in 1922, or whatever year it was. The Irish are an unmannerly bunch. They never had any respect for women. Just imagine what they would do to the Queen. And now for a brief look at the weather. Oh God, isn't it awful? Will this rain ever stop? So much for the weather. Nucht in Irish at 8 o'clock. News in English at 9.30. Give or take a couple of minutes to allow for the commercial breaks. And so, from me to you until then, it's good night. And if you can't be good, be careful. <laughs> that was bad enough. 
But when the Ballymagash Urban District Council caught sight of the new article, all hell broke loose. It's a great wonder somebody wasn't hurt. Gentlemen, there is no point in bolting the stable door after the board has flown. They've turfed Kathleen E. Horicon off the front of the Irish five pound note without as much as a kiss me elbow, and in our place they've put some baldy headed old Tuller Ramon wrapped up in a horse blanket. One of their own be the look of it. Yeah, withdraw that now, Mr. Chairman. This matter is above politics the same as the presidency. In other words, let Fianna Fáil walk away with it once again. My God, oh, crowd, your crowd must be daft and they ever get sent. What are you getting at, Councillor Cooney? I, Fianna Fáil have taken over Green Acres in the Phoenix Park for the fifth time, running. And then they know they're taking over the five-pound note as well. That man on the fiver is Deputy Joe Brennan. That's who it is. Who's he? I, I look at now. Don't, 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 don't be stupid, Councillor. Have you not seen one of the new fivers yet? One of the new ones? I haven't even seen one of the old ones. Oh, God, look, you are all talking through your other papers. The man on the fiver isn't Joe Brennan at all. He's some university professor by the name of Don Scrotum or something like that. You're making the bags of it, Councillor O'Hara. The man's name, and I'll tell it to you, the man's name that's on the fiver is John Scottus Erigenius. I have it here in the encyclopedia. Be God, he was a great man for the writing, so he was. Oh, God, he must have been woeful brainy to get into that cycle pedestrian book you have there. <laughs> he certainly wasn't fiend to fall anyway. That <laughs> one's wrong. It makes no difference what the hell he was or who he was. What I want to know is by what right did he get his fizz on plastered all over the five pound note in place of Kathleen E. Hurricane? I mean, the front of it is bad enough, all in Irish. If it wasn't for the figure five, you wouldn't know what it was. But you can't make head nor tail of what wrote on the back of it. And what does that picture the animal signify? Is it some sort of ad about rabies or what? I believe it is from the piss letter of Rice Marcus. Salter, Mr Chairman, Salter. Salt who? P-S-A-L-T-E-R, Salter, not piss letter. The P is silent. Yeah, well, I hope you remember that, Councillor Rooney, the next time you're relieving yourself in the men's washroom. It is a woeful noise entirely, like Niagara Falls, so it is. Ah, look, it's a pity they wouldn't come down on top of you, Councillor Hall, and put a stop to your blather. Be good. Be good to think of a woman that has meant so much to this country for the past 38 years. Aye. A household favourite to four generations of Irish men and women. Right. A face beloved and familiar to us all as our own mothers, wives and sweethearts. And to think the only way we can get a look at her now is to hold her up to the light. Oh, God, if the grub gets any dearer, you won't be able to see any of us unless you hold us up to the light. <laughs> Gentlemen, I propose that we do not let this insult pass without doing something about it. Even if it's not. Aye, well, that much is least. No, that's the least we can do. I propose that we take vigorous action, vigorous action, to restore Kathleen E. Hurricane to her rightful place on the front of the fiver and matter a damn who they put in the white space. If what, what sort of vigorous action, Mr Chairman? What do you mean, what sort of vigorous action, Mr Chairman? It's none of your bloody business. What sort of vigorous action, Mr Chairman? Councillor O'Hora, do you think that the, the Minister for Hardship tells his cabinet what sort of vigorous action he's going to take? He just tells them to shut their mouths and shout aye. And I want you to shout aye and leave the vigorous action to me. All in favour of vigorous action. Aye. I think it can be said with confidence that the appearance of John Scotus Air Eugenia on the new five pound note must be the most unpopular appointment of modern times. And mind you, that's saying something. Well, anyway, what does he think of it himself? Well, for an answer to that question, our reporter tracked down the man in question to his comfortable detached uh, residence in uh, Sandyford County, Dublin, which is known as the Mint. Sandyford County, Dublin, is now known in banking circles as the hole with the mint in it. Perhaps you could tell us, Your Excellency, how you came to be chosen for this position. Well, as a figurehead, the successful candidate had to be unpolitical, uncontroversial and unknown. It was agreed that I fitted the bill perfectly on all three grounds. It, many people have commented upon your striking resemblance to Inspector Theobald Kojak of the New York Police Force. Ah, yes. Quis infantoque amat. I understand his hat was in the ring until he heard that he would be powerless to arrest anyone for what's happening to the currency. How do you think the fiver will fare during your term of office? Well, if things don't get better, which seems unlikely, they will undoubtedly get worse. It will be my duty to give an example to the people by standing with my back to the wall, my shoulder to the wheel, my hand to the plough and my ear to the ground. Will that be enough to restore confidence in the five pound note? Well, if not, I shall explore every angle, leave no stone unturned, and neglect no opportunity to buttress the infrastructure. 
I shall urge short-term borrowings in the interest of long-term aims, even if this involves rocking the boat in order to dislodge the flow of wage demands which are lodged in the pipeline. But if, in spite of all that, the economy becomes overheated, causing the inflationary spiral to vanish up its own international monetary fundament, and thereby causing our international creditors to demand their pound of flesh plus 25% compound interest in Stanta. What will be your reaction then? Well, have no fear, young man. If any of these international loan sharks who have disgraced the honorable profession of pawnbroking and made even the humble bank robber blush with shame, if these reprehensible rogues come here and try to lay their filthy fingers on the fiver, they'll get no change out of me. Good evening to you. Well, isn't it well fair to be settling down after a good day for an evening of enjoyment? And here's me only starting my night's work and the talk about the glamour of television. Glamour, how are you? If you only knew. Well, later on tonight, if there isn't a breakdown, we'll be presenting Spot the Tune with the Kilawiwi Chamber Ensemble under its musical director, Yehudi Mkhbaran. Here is a short excerpt from one of their better pieces entitled Come back to Erden Fords, Mavornin, Mavornin. You're right, lads. Right. Him to a preacher toy! Well, wasn't that gorgeous? And that was them only churning up. Faith, when they get their yokes in proper trim, they can footer it out the best you ever heard. By the way, we'd like to say a special thanks to Tommy Ellis for the lend of the big fiddle. Well, that's the way we try and do things in Ballymagash too. Nice and homely. None of your big, flahulic, flashy productions flying in, big stars like Tony Kenny from Dublin, that sort of thing. Now, RTE may try and compete with the BBC if they want to. That's their business. But we compete with nobody. We don't even have to try. Now, have a note here, yes. Mr. TV Fun is director of programmes of BTV2, and he had a few words to say recently on the subject of outside broadcasts, or OBs, as we in the racket, I mean in the business, call them. Mr. Fun was answering questions at a seminar on the future of Ballymagash TV2 in the Ballymagash Vocational School. Could you tell us what is an outside broadcast? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. In the first place, an outside broadcast takes place outside. Outside what? Outside some place. You see, there's some places it's very hard to get into, so you have to broadcast from outside them. That's why they call them outside broadcasts. Yeah. What's the difference between an outside broadcast and an inside yes. broadcast, Mr. Oh, no. oh. An inside broadcast takes place from inside. That's why we call them ABs. Inside broadcasts. And is there any other difference? Well, the expense mainly. You see, especially in RTE now, RTE, like, would send three or four van loads of equipment out into the countryside and 25 or 30 mechanics out to look after it, like, you know, well, that costs a bomb and the local people is complaining at the way RTE is squandering their money, but if they don't do outside broadcasts, the local people is complaining that they're being ignored. I don't know why they bother with them outside broadcast. They're more trouble than the work. Tell me this, will there be any OBs on VTV too, Mr. Fawn? Oh, oh, God, eh, there certainly will. Oh, <laughs> but you can rest assured of one thing, there'll be damn all money wasted on them. How will you manage, though? That's none of your business, Sonny. There's far too many smart Alex trying to tell us our business lately. Anyway, it's far too technical for the likes of use. Actually, the, the Ballymagash OB technique is quite unique because, you see, it's partly inside and it's partly outside. The technical name for it is an inside-outside broadcast, or IOB for short. The IM studio is getting a fresh coat of whitewash. 
So instead this evening we're going to move outside the studio and ask members of the public what they think of a recent statement by the Minister for Health and Social Welfare that drink should be taxed beyond the means of the drinker for his own sake, of course. Now our, pan oh, our panel of panellists are Mrs. Floresita Tarfi, <laughs> Chairperson of the Artificial Insemination Reform Society, and Mr. Fistus O'Toole, MT, retired. And, oh, how fortunate the PP, Monsignor Romulus Todd, walking his dogs. Well, you know Monsignor first, as usual. Do you think that the minister was right in wishing to tax drink beyond the means of the drinker? Well, I wish him the height of good luck. And if he succeeds, where Father Matthew failed, we should erect a statue to him in the middle of Oliver J. Flanagan Street. No, Flores is a deal. Well, it makes no difference to me how much tax the minister puts on drink. I'll still have my G and T anyhow. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> It'll only affect the ordinary oh, people, yeah. and it's just what they deserve. They voted him in. I certainly didn't. <laughs> uh, Mr. O'Toole, what are your views on this controversial matter? Well, in the first place, oh, in the common. first place, as I'll have time for. Oh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. O'Toole. And I'm afraid that's all we have time for. And this all be from AM this PM on account of the inclement weather. Fair play now. I think you must agree that Ballymagash Television has invented the perfect way to run a second television service without plunging the whole town into debt. But in all honesty, uh, I have to admit that we've had our setbacks. Notably, when we asked the Dublin Urban District Council to let us have the loan of their hall in order to film an episode in our, our thrilling crime series about a fictitious councillor Burke of the fictitious uh, kitchen party. It got big headlines in the Irish Times. All the world's a stage, but not City Hall. The story begins as follows. Dublin Urban District councillors yesterday most emphatically refused to give permission to Ballymagash TV to film some scenes in a forthcoming series in their hall. Well, this play contains a senior garda, the likes of which does not exist in this country, or any other country either. The script is immaterial to us. The question is this, is our hall a fitting place for drama? Be it serious or of the Gambian mentality? I don't think so. Let Barry McGash TV build our own props. Yeah, well, if they don't get in here, they get in someplace else. Right. There's oddballs here as well as everywhere else. Right. The history shows that we have some of the greatest goodies of all time on the council. Yeah, yeah. We must defend this proud boast at all costs. Yeah, why well, object to these TV people coming in here? I mean, I wasn't elected to sell our props for anyone. Unless a councillor on the play, he was in jail. Oh, well, we've managed to escape that so far. We shouldn't lower ourselves to this kind of carry on. I agree. The script lowers the tone of the place. There's enough funny men in the city without coming up here to look at them. We're not paid for that. The whole thing is cheapskating on the part of Ballymagash. Why don't they spend the money foolish, the same as RTE does? Why should we let them in here to make a comic at our expense? Here, here. I mean, it's, it's one thing, uh, the Dublin people making, making a skit out of the culties, but it's a different matter when the culties come up here for, for to make a skit out of the Dublin people. Yeah, I mean, we're else. perfectly capable of doing that ourselves. We're, we're, they're not going to come in here and make a Washington behind closed doors at our expense. No way. At times, we have councils who can be quite amusing yes. uh, when they have a few jays on them. <laughs> <laughs> but that's our affair. Yes. That's not for the public. If these people want to make a mock-up of the uh -huh. chamber, let them bloody well pay for it. We are not in the business to help any TV crowd to save money or anybody else either. Anyway, anyway, they'll be helping to give much needed employment if they have to build their set. And that's more than we can do. What do Bally Magash people say when they hear about our attitude? None of your go be the wild tactics here, Mr Hannigan. We don't go one solitary damn what the Dublin people thinks of our attitude. So why the hell do we care what they think of our attitude in this hole in the ditch, bally MacBleeding, whatever you call it? I propose we tell them all to go to hell. Damn and their bloody play. All in favour? Okay. By this time of the night, you have suffered enough. So we are going to try and distract your minds from your suffering by reporting on an event or a series of events indeed, which is causing consternation throughout the length and breadth of London. This is a six weeks long cultural jamboree called A Sense of Ireland, and it covers everything from an exhibition of patchwork quilts to the RTE Symphony Orchestra. In between, there are regiments of traditional musicians, 43 writers, five lectures, 
paintings and photographs of all descriptions, several seminars, and an item that puzzles me, which is called the position of women in Ireland. Now, the Kilauea Chamber and Symbol was a hit of the Sense of Ireland Festival over in London recently, and I spoke earlier on to their leader, Yehudi McBauran, about how he was getting on over the end. Well, we, we got on like a horse on fire, so we did. Just to give you an idea, we started off in an Irish pub in Kilburn, filthy Franks. <laughs> but when the board got round the English highbrow connection, they had to shift us to the Albert Hall for the rest of the fortnight, twice a night. <laughs> a lad from the BBC said he never heard anything like of it in his life. We in Britain have a great regard for the Irish. Terry Wogan, Val Doonigan, Eamon Andrews, Dave Allen. <laughs> in fact, we'd never think of them as Irish at all if they didn't keep on apologising for it. <laughs> Only now does one begin to realise why Cromwell tried so hard to exterminate the Irish. After six weeks listening to them, talking, singing, acting, fiddling, drinking, fighting, one could only wish that Cromwell had succeeded. A sense of Ireland must have been a great success entirely, you hoody. Oh, something fierce. <laughs> you couldn't get a drink in the length and breadth of London all the time to sign. Well, you're satisfied with us. Satisfied? What are you talking about? Nobody breathes a sober breath the whole time. <laughs> it made the flake you all look like a pioneer social in comparison. <laughs> It'll take a month to clear away them ties. <laughs> Finally, you hoody, what are your plans for the immediate future? Well, uh, we're like, uh, we're, we're planning like, to, to, to cash in on the, on the publicity. So we're looking for a field in Benamagash big enough to hold a crowd. Talk about the bone torn rats. <laughs> we'll tighten the tail of them lads when we start. Woohoo! But the whole scope of this operation is so vast, it's so imaginative and so expensive that a few people here still aren't able to grasp the real meaning of it. Well, yeah. Ah. Isn't it fantastic to think that at last the people in London is getting a chance to learn all about Irish culture? Fantastic, yeah, fantastic is the <laughs> word, boy. By the time it is all over, the Cockneys will know more about Irish culture than the people of Ireland was themselves. I know what was, yeah. <laughs> That's not an awful lot. Because we have more on our minds to worry us than culture. Too fine, boy. A sense of Ireland. <laughs> but what's it for, anyway? What it's for, yeah, is to make the Cockneys believe that the Irish people thinks of nothing, only culture. But the thing is this, my boy, what is culture? Culture is, it's the, yeah, yeah it, 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 wait, wait, I have an answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know all that high-class music, what beyond the wireless and what no one listens to? I do, yeah, well, sort of like. And do you know all them high-class books and poems what no one understands? Uh, yeah. And do you know all them high-class plays what the people of Rochestown has to put on their dress suit for to be seen at? Well, um... Put them all together, chair, and you has culture. There you are. Up here you need a point. Can you answer me this, no, boy? Why does the culture crowd want them cockneys to think that we are mad about Irish culture? Should the Rogers down Road crowd by, they wouldn't let us. You know, that's a very difficult question to answer, See? too, Chair. See? But here, one way or the other, it don't matter a damn to us, Chair. No? Nah? Cause culture or no culture, Chair, we still has to saunter over to the Libra every week and sign on for our poor man's dividend. What well, you mean the dual money? What else do you think I mean? Of course I mean the dual money. Only that's a very uncultured way of putting it, yeah. When you think that half the writers and artists and the fiddle players in the country are over in London, doing their not week in, week out for Irish culture. Yeah. Where's yeah. your sense of Ireland, sir? Yeah? Huh? I'd love to see you at an evening of eats. <laughs> oh, since. <laughs> Of course, it's just the smallest bit difficult for some of us here at home, not you and me, of course, I mean, there's other people, to understand why all those thousands of talented writers, lecturers, actors and musicians are all over in London, spending their time and our money telling the Brits about Irish culture. Because if we're to judge by what's coming out of Britain these days, they seem to have lost all respect for their own culture. So why should they care about our culture? That ours is not the reason why. 
ours but to grin and pay. Somebody somewhere must know what they're doing, I hope. It's a bit of a puzzle all the same. And isn't it a comfort to know that wherever art and culture are gathered together, there too will be Farrell O'Brien in the midst of them to relieve our ignorance. So here we go to London via the Ballymagash turf-burning communication satellite where Farrell is waiting to talk down to us. Good evening. Need I tell you that this is Farrell O'Brien speaking to you live from the spiritual home of every self-respecting Irishman, the great city of London, the international centre of blue movies and strip clubs. Who but me could contrive to be in two places at one and the same time? How do I do it? Genius, pure genius. After spending an entire afternoon and evening explaining the intricacies of the budget to your feeble minds, it's a refreshing change to plunge into the intellectual whirlpool of a sense of Ireland, which is all of London asking the question, where on earth do they get the money? We all thought that the Irish Exchequer was broke. It is, of course, but when did that ever stop them? But first, I hand you over to my envious young imitator, Barney Mulberry, the Ballymagash TV representative in London and part-time barman. Ah, thank you, Tom. <coughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm speaking to you from the Shan Van Buck Bear Discotheque Dungeon Cast and Social Centre here in Kilburn, where a press reception has been held to inaugurate the most important event in the whole shebang, <laughs> the Spoon Plane Exhibition. Oh, my God, now who do I see staggering? I mean, <laughs> coming across the room, we got is none other than John Joe Max Plockett, chairman of the Billy McGash Arts Council. <laughs> How she couldn't, John Joe? <laughs> oh, for that, he did. <laughs> did you ever see the bit of this for oh, culture and great, heritage? Great, right? great, great. Port from his band, you know, only brandy and cocktails by order. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, by we're giving the Brits culture with a capital K. <laughs> they thought we was pig ignorant up to this, you know. They couldn't get over it that I knew all about Nottingham Forest. Hey, young man. <laughs> it says here in the programme that the purpose of a sense of Ireland is to demonstrate in England the depth and strength of Ireland's heritage and contemporary culture. Yes. Bloody right. <laughs> yes. Well, is it succeeding? What are you talking about succeeding? Su these bloody Englishmen can't get over it. They're amazed we're so smart. They can't get over the amount of drinks that we're lashing out free. One man, a cabinet minister he was, and he told me that we're twice as cultured as the French, he said. A glass of wine is all you get out with them. Yes, well, <laughs> thank you, John. You're Max Brockett. I'll have you know. to leave, you know, because right. the old kidneys is more ah, yes, you know. Off, right. off had you a go. very tough week. Off you go. <laughs> good, man, good man, good man. Now, I'm going to speak to a very special guest, a real English lady, and God knows there's, there's, uh, it's hard enough to find one of them. Well, this is Mrs. Margaret Thatcher, the English teacher. Oh, hello, uh, hello. Thank you, everyone. Oh, how, how are you? How are you? Oh, oh. <laughs> That's what I love about you, Irish. Your warm, charming informality. <laughs> ah, yes. My goodness, it's a long time since anyone here addressed me as Maggie. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> oh! Listen, uh, what, what do you think of Irish culture now, huh? It takes some bit, doesn't it? You must have been surprised that we wear shoes. <laughs> I'm here to attend a sense of Ireland, uh, never, aren't never I? Never mind that, no, never mind that. Slip out the back with me now and enjoy a real oh, sense of boy. Ireland. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, oh, dear. Just when I was beginning to enjoy myself, thank you for your charming invitation, but I've just been reminded of an appointment to visit a sense of Zimbabwe Rhodesia. Oh, yes, yes. My word, we do live in exciting times, don't we? I wonder what Jim Callaghan will think about this. Thank goodness I'm not in labour. Wherever I go in this historic old city of London, so much more picturesque than Dublin, I see amongst the Irish people a new feeling of pride being accepted as fellow human beings by the people of Britain. All of it directly attributable to the marvellously organised and massively expensive Sense of Ireland Festival. But now it's time to go over to the Irish Centre for Higher Codology in Bond Street, where the Minister for Factories and Holidays is about to open a unique exhibition, the nature of which has been kept a secret up to the last moment. 
No. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasant duty to introduce our Minister for Factories and Holidays to open the exhibition. Minister. <clears throat> Good evening, our Fáil Chirot, as we say in Ireland sometimes. It gives me great pleasure, although you wouldn't think it to look at me, to be here this evening to open this Irish cap-touching exhibition as part of a sense of Ireland. Yeah, yeah. In a sense, a sense of Ireland itself is nothing but an artfully disguised cap-touching exhibition, the largest of its kind ever mounted in the history of our state. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's what brings us here to London in our thousands for six full weeks to touch our caps. Would ye send four or five thousands of year artists and musicians over to us for six weeks to put on a sense of England? <laughs> ye would in my back. So if ye won't come to us, we must come to ye. And yeah. that, that, in a nutshell, is the essence of cap touching. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ye haven't the manners nor the experience to touch your caps. Ye had the ball at your feet for far too long, but now ye can't make steel and ye can't sell cars, and ye see have ye by the hasp. Ye'll have to learn to touch your caps if ye want to survive. Yeah, 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 yeah. And fortunately for ye, it's the official policy for all parties in Ireland to touch their caps to the British, and that's why I'm here in London tonight to present an expert team of parliamentary cap touchers representing each of the main political parties, and here they are. <laughs> first, first, of, first of all, we have the representative of the Field and Foil Party. Thank you, thank you. Now the representative of the Fine Girl Party. And last, but by no means least, the laborious party version. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> now, Minister. <laughs> well, later on, they'll be telling you all the tricks of the trade, and during their stay in this country, they'll, they'll visit every public house in the greater London area yeah, yeah. to <laughs> share their experience with the ordinary people. And so, without further ado, I now declare this Irish cap-touching exhibition open. And may the devil give you good of it. Thank you. Here we are. For a yeah. 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 And now I'm going over by satellite to Bellamy Getsch, where the greatest cap toucher of them all, Deputy Judas Muckle Slevine, is waiting to give his comments on the festival. Good evening, Deputy Muckle Slevine. Can you hear me? Indeed I can, Your Honour, and good evening to you. So am not I the proud and humble man this blessed night that God has spared me to be sitting here in dear old Ireland and talking to Your Honour's own self beyond in the great city of London itself? It's yourself that must be the happy man to witness all them wonderful Irish people going all out to show them English people God love them. That us Irish is near as civilised as themselves. It was badly needed, so it was. What about this presentation called The Irish Duke? Oh, how well Your Honour would notice that. Well, I may as well own up, for you'd find out sooner or later. That's me, Your Honour. And you can rest assured that I won't say one word out of place. There's one great thing about the Irish joke. When people do be laughing at you, they don't be criticising you. And by the time this festival is over, there'll be that many people in England laughing at us. I'm afraid we've lost sound from Belly McGersh. What a pity. Now we shan't be able to hear the Minister's interesting observation. Well, this is Farrell O'Brien in London returning you reluctantly to the studio in Belly McGash. Till we meet again, let me leave you with this profound thought. If God hadn't created television, think of all you would have missed. Me. Good night. <laughs> So what is the sense of Ireland? Well, the only way to find out is to go across to London and see for yourself, because you certainly can't make head or tail of it over here. Good night. Yeah.